Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Adobe Live. My name is Terry White, Worldwide Photography Evangelist here at Adobe, and it's my pleasure to be streaming to you live once again from my Atlanta studio. Cheers, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're a couple weeks out now, like from Adobe Max, so this will be my last stream until live stream until after Max. We'll do a couple replays for the next couple Fridays, but I'm happy to. Uh, do this last pre-max stream uh, about a topic that's just fun, and that's um, when people do things in Photoshop, maybe not the best way, so bad habits. I, I did this topic about Lightroom because there's lots of Lightroom things you can do that um, maybe aren't the best techniques or best ways to do it or just, you know, sloppy, just bad organization, whatever. And that topic went over very well, so I was like, well, maybe it's time to try this with uh, Photoshop. The difference is with Photoshop, um, a bad habit is, you know, someone's technique could be a bad habit. So it's just it, one, one opinion of a bad habit is someone's opinion of this is my creativity. So it's a little harder with Photoshop because there's so many different ways to do the same thing that it's like it's opinion at that point if it's a bad habit. Now, certain things are just bad habits, and I will cover those as my top 10. But some things are just like Photoshop fails or just, you know, just, um, well, they did it the, the most roundabout way, but they got it done. And who's to argue with re the result? If the result was the photo you wanted or the image you wanted, you created what you wanted, then if it took you 10 times longer to do it than maybe someone else, eh, it's not a bad habit. You're just still learning uh, the best method. All right, so with that said, um, a couple of housekeeping rules. If you're watching this somewhere else, like I see people chiming in over on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, I see Nicole, I see uh, Lorraine, I see Kevin Stewart, I see Patricia over there on YouTube. Great, you guys can hang over on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn all you want. But if you wanna see the main chat, you wanna see what's really going on, head over to b.net slash Adobe Live. That's the main chat I'll be looking at. If I get a chance to glance over at the other window and see your question, great. Uh, but I remember a couple streams ago, after the stream was over, I looked over and noticed someone's question that would have been easy to answer, but I didn't see it in time. So it was too late. The stream was over. Didn't get a chance to do it. All right. Um, finding me on Behance is challenging every week. Then you must not be following me on social media because I like post the link to social media all the time, especially 24 hours on my Instagram story. So the link is right there. All you have to do is click on it. And if you, if you don't, you don't have to find me, b.net slash Adobe Live every Friday, 8 a.m. Pacific time, 11 a.m. Eastern. So that's the link. You don't have to do anything else. b.net slash Adobe Live. So Mary Brown, easy to find. And worst case scenario, you can watch it on my YouTube or Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter. All right, so with all that said, um, let's dive right in. I think that's pretty much covered everything, right? I'm not streaming live for a couple of weeks. Watch on b.net slash Adobe Live. Told you what the topic is. I think we're good to go. All right, so let's dive in. I'm going to switch over to my desktop. Um, and I want to show you something when I switch over to the desktop. It's a website. And all I did this morning was just Google Photoshop fails. I'll start with a couple of those, then we'll dive into my top 10. But the first fail, or I'm sorry, no, not the first fail. The first bad habit, the reason that these are Photoshop fails is the bad habit was not checking your work. Meaning not looking at the overall image before it's posted, before it's sent off to the client, before it's put on a magazine cover. So that's the fail. That's the first bad habit, is not checking your work. When you're finished with an image, do that visual 360 looking all the way around the edges of the image, looking at the image from top to bottom, left to right, left to right, this go, goes that way for me. Uh, <laughs> top to bottom goes that way for me. Anyway, uh, never mind. So that's the um, first and most important bad habit is not checking your work. So let me show you what I mean. So this is an actual, for what I understand, Vogue cover. And at first it looks like a group of women, great, awesome, until you drill down in one particular area. Right here, 
let me get my mouse right here. <laughs> See this hand? I, I'm assuming that it's her arm because she's the only one facing this way. So if you look at her body is way over here. This is her arm. Her elbow would have to be like right here. So her arm stretches all the way over to here. Like not likely. And when we zoom in, we can just see how badly that hand is stretched. So, huge Photoshop fail, especially to be on a, on a magazine cover of a, you know, important magazine, big magazine. But um, keep in mind, not only did the person using Photoshop do this incorrectly, just bad, but look at how many people this probably went through and no one noticed it before it got printed or before it got, you know, posted, whatever. So... The Photoshop bad habit is not, well, first of all, that was just a bad Photoshop, but the bad habit would be not looking at everything because when people, especially when they composite people together, you end up <laughs> a lot of times with extra hands, extra arms, extra elbows, extra things. And if you look, if you Google Photoshop fail, you'll find tons of examples of just bad compositing people together with too many body parts. Like in other words, they they left someone's hand that used to be there and then they brought the other person's hand. So now there are three hands for that person. So just keep that in mind that when you're doing this this type type of work, um, if you're adding things, make it real. Like don't don't add things and not make it like because we'll know. We'll know it's not real. Here's another example. Now this isn't something that was added. This was something that was removed. Uh, apparently this was Victoria's Secret and this model was holding a handbag, it looks like at, at one point, and the person photoshopped away the handbag without photoshopping away the rest of the strap in the hand. So again, that's just lazy Photoshop. Like, um, they probably started on it, removed the bag, got carried away, start working on something else, never came back to finish this. That's my guess. Because I, I can't believe they did this and said, okay, I'm done. Like they, they, I doubt if they left it like that on purpose and figuring they were done. I think they just got distracted, went on, start working on something else and forgot to come back and finish this part. So check your work. That's Photoshop bad habit. Number one, not checking your work before the finished job is done. Okay. Um, so that's it. I, I, cause I could spend a whole hour just going through websites and looking at people's mistakes. That's not going to help you. It'll make you laugh, but it's not going to help you much. All right, so let's get to Photoshop and let's show you some of my other my other nine bad habits. So let's pop over to Photoshop. And a lot of these will be common. Like if I asked you to list Photoshop bad habits, some of these you're going to just know right off the bat. Like be, even if you still do them, you're still going to say, yeah, that's a bad habit. I probably still shouldn't do that. Um, the one that uh, people literally get upset about when they see someone do this, and that is doing everything on the background. Like not making a duplicate layer first, not making a smart object first, not making some kind of way of protecting yourself from coming back. So that is bad habit number two, um, not, not protecting yourself in a more non-destructive workflow. So for example, you bring up an image where you like this, where you want to start removing some of the blemishes and bad habit is you just jump right in and start doing it. Clone stamp, spot healing brush, patch tool, whatever it is you're going to do, and you just start doing it. Now, I do that all the time because A, I'm, I know what I'm doing with my own work. <laughs> B, I don't have a client that's going to come back and say, hey, I want that pimple or that mole back. If I'm, if I'm doing this work, it's usually for me. So I'm the person that you know approves it at the end or not because it's for it's for my portfolio it's for my work. So I'm the only one that's going to screw myself up if I mess up something and I have to start over because that's worst case scenario. Like I always have a copy of the original photo anyway, and if I have to start over, I have to start over. Okay, I, I wasted some time. And in all the years I've been doing this kind of stuff, I've only had to start over less than five times. Like less than five times I've said, oh, I completely screwed this image up. I did not protect myself with duplicate layers and all that. I, it's just easier to start from scratch. Less than a handful of times in all the years I've been doing this. But for the people that, you know, again, we're talking about bad habits. One of the easiest ways to not have this issue 
is before you get started, you take that background layer and you drag it down to the plus sign on the layers panel and duplicate the layer. So now all the work you're doing, number one, it gives you a before and after because you can turn off the working layer and turn on the um, turn on the working layer and turn it off to see the layer below it. So then you'll see how far you've come. That's a, another reason for doing this. But now if I were going to start working, because I'm working on um, on this duplicate layer, I can go ahead and start removing this temporary acne. That's why I remove it because of stuff that's not going to be there in a week or two. So why punish the person by showing a photo of a bad skin day when that skin is going to clear right up and this is the way the person normally looks. So this is my before, this is my after. Great. I got a duplicate layer. I save it as a Photoshop file or worst case scenario, a TIFF. And I always have my uh, original to go back to. All right, um, and, and Reverb Mike says, I only learn things like this the hard way. <laughs> yeah, again, having you, you get too far and you mess up bad and then you're like, oh, sh you know, oh, crap. Now I got to start over from scratch. But like I said, it, it's, it's, it's up to you. So you, it's just like buying insurance. If you don't buy insurance, you run the risk of having to pay for whatever the item is if something happens to it. You buy insurance, you have to pay a little bit more money up front, but then you're protected if something happens to it. So look at an extra copy of your layer as insurance. Duplicating a layer first doesn't cost you a whole lot, costs you a little bit of file size, costs you a couple seconds to do it, but then you, you always have that background to come back to. All right. Um, bad habit number three, leaving that layer called background copy. <laughs> so not naming your layers is basically the bad habit. Couple layers, no big deal. Five, five six, seven, eight, 20, 50, 100 layers, big deal. Um, because I'll, I can look at this file and know why, why that's called background copy because that's my working layer. Because there's only two. But if I get into having to create a whole bunch of layers and they're called layer one, layer 20, layer 30, I'm never gonna remember what layer, what purpose layer five serves. I'll have to look at the layers panel for a second, think about, okay, why is that layer? There? Oh yeah, that's the layer I'm doing the dodge and burn on. So like, I, if you don't name the layer, you're just causing yourself grief later on, maybe not that day, because you're working on it, you kind of know what you're doing, but later on, when you come back to that file, having to remember what all those layers are for. All right, so for example, just double click on background copy and call this, you know, um, retouching layer or working layer, whatever it is, whatever that layer, whatever you know what that means when you see the words, call it that. So whether it's retouching, skin retouching, blemish removal layer, whatever you want to call it, if that's all you're going to do on that layer, do it. It could be my working layer, whatever you're going to, whatever's going to make you know what that layer is for, name that layer. All right. Um, when do you work on a blank layer to retouch? That's just another safety thing. So another way that people might do this, I'm going to turn off my uh, layer this way. Another people, another way people might do this is they might create an empty layer and then use the um, sample all layers feature to do all. So I'm doing the exact same thing. I'm just doing it on an empty layer. So now the blemish removal is only happening on the empty layer because I, and by the way, the only way that's going to work is you got to make sure the tool you're working on either samples all layers or the layers below as well. Uh, so I'm doing the exact same thing I was doing before, but now it's happening on the empty layer. So to answer that question uh, from Amelia, when do I do that? I, me personally, hardly ever. I know, I know people do it that way, but it's just, again, that's a technique thing. So if you like doing it that way, it's probably going to save you some space because you're not duplicating a whole layer. You're just putting the retouches on another layer. So that, that layer takes up a whole lot less space and less file size than the whole duplicate of the layer. Because the only thing that ends up on that layer, literally, are the blemishes. So that's really the smarter way to do this. If I have to admit it, that would be the way to do this instead of duplicating the whole layer. But by duplicating the whole layer, I still have the whole layer to do other things. So that's why I tend to not do just a retouch layer like that. 
because I duplicated the layer because I'm going to do a bunch of other things on it. And that could be another bad habit. Maybe you need another layer for all the other things you're going to do. So that way you can always come back to, oh, I don't like the blemish removal layer. Throw that one away and do something else. So it's, it's really at this point preference. I've always been a duplicate the whole layer person if I'm going to do it at all. That way I have the whole layer to work with. But there's nothing wrong with this method either. Just don't leave it called layer one. So we can call this the um, uh, blemish removal layer. Or blemish, yeah. Blemish removal layer. All right, so now we got both, whichever one works best for you. All right, um, that's my fixes layer. All right, cool. That, that's it. Everybody has their, their, their technique in their name. All right, so that was number two or three. I can't remember. I'm not going to remember. I'm not going to keep track of the count. I'm just bad at that. So let's get on to the next one. Um, yeah, this is this is a this is a favorite one. Here, let's go here. This is one I showed. Uh, I was in a, a workshop earlier this week, and I was showing people like they, they were new to a lot of them were new to Photoshop, hadn't ever used Photoshop before. So I was showing them how not to do things <laughs> and and how to do things too. So let's say you have this, this nice table here and we want to composite like this lamp on this table. Now, um, one of the bad habits that I didn't mention, but this is a bad habit, is when you're about to do a composite like this, one of the biggest bad habits or dead giveaways that people will have with a composite is the perspective is off from the object you're bringing in to the object that you're bringing it into. So look at the level and angle of the table and then look at the lamp that I'm about to bring in. So when I bring this lamp in, don't worry about the background right now, but when I bring the lamp in, and even if I size it down, look at the base of the lamp and how it's like tilted up a little bit and then look at the table. Even without the background, that lamp won't ever look right on that table unless you change the perspective of it. Because the lamp is more facing forward, the table's more leaning backwards or backwards into the scene. So let's talk about my bad habit first, then we'll talk about the perspective, maybe how you might fix this. Okay, so bad habit, um, and here, let me, because I brought this in from a, uh, from a library, it's, it's a smart object. So let's get rid of the smart object for a second. All right, so, um, Next bad habit, using, uh, what did I call it? I said uh, erasing instead of masking. But basically it's also just using old methods, uh, methods from the 90s when Photoshop first came out that people are still using to this day that may get the job done, but it's not the best way. So I've, I've studied this for, for a couple decades now of working at Adobe. When a new version of Photoshop, Illustrator, whatever it is, comes out, people grab the new version because especially now you're on subscription, you grab the new version and you kind of look around. Yeah, okay, cool. Oh, there's a new thing over there. Oh, there's a new thing over there. And you go back to using it the way you always did because we're so busy, we don't always take the time to learn the new way that the, the, the new features are in there. And number two, what's even worse is the new way the new method probably will save you time. So if you took the time just to learn the new method, instead of using the old method that you've used for years, you're probably gonna end up with better results and faster. All right, so the old, old, old way of doing this would have been grab the eraser tool. I made a joke during the class. I said, friends don't let friends use the eraser tool. But you would grab the eraser tool and you just start erasing this layer, this, this background, until you got it all erased and chances are you're still going to miss stuff. And then you'd have to zoom in and get in close and so forth and so on. So, yeah, how long will that take? So um, you, then you might say, oh, I can use, uh, someone said the magic wand. You might use... Uh, another old tool like the magic wall, select the lamp, inverse, and then delete. Yeah, that, that'll all work. And all of this will work, but all of this is the old way of doing it. They may not be the fastest, best way. That's all we're saying. 
So it doesn't <laughs> lasso, yes. Try and lasso the lamp and get it just right. That's that's my favorite right there, Fiona. Um, but yeah, using the old way is is just gonna take you longer and maybe not give you the best results. So let's undo that. Let's get rid of that. Let's never touch the eraser again unless there's some real good reason to use it, which is rare. But um, how would we do this? Well, I a couple of years ago, I might just simply say, select subject, inverse, uh, select and inverse, and then hit the mask button. Oh, I did it the wrong way. I don't have to inverse. Sorry. I'm thinking of something else. I'll inverse and delete. So don't inverse and just hit the mask button. Done. Hey, that was faster. That was way faster than erasing. So select subject, which selected the lamp perfectly, and then and then hit um, mask. Done. Because what that will do on that layer is create a layer mask and it's not erased, it's not permanent. You can always bring part of it back and you're all set. So just there's no reason to ever erase for this, for this purpose again. Now, let me undo that one more time. Let's deselect, command D, oh, by the way, undo. Another bad habit people have because they never learn deselect. So we're used to when we have selections like this in any other program, any other application, when you select something, the way you deselect it is just click off of it, click away from it, click on to something else, and that will always deselect. Well, that, that's not how Photoshop works. Photoshop doesn't deselect unless you're in another selection tool. So if I was in the lasso or something like that and I click off of it, then that will deselect it. But depending on the selection tool I'm in, that may make another selection. So a bad habit is just trying to make, to deselect this lamp by clicking off of it. So the easiest, I'll show it to you under the menu, the easiest way to deselect things is a keyboard shortcut on Mac, it's Command D, Windows Control D, that will always deselect safely. You don't have to be in a selection tool, you don't have to be in any, any particular tool to do it, and nine times out of 10, if you had something selected, still selected by accident or, or selected by accident, and you're trying to paint or clone or do something on another part of the photo and it's not working, I always hit Command D instinctively because I, I just, I probably have something else selected. That's why it's not letting me do it. So just whenever a tool's not working, first thing to do, Command D, PC, Control D, then try the tool again. If it's still not working, then there may be something to do with the tool. But that's usually because there's a selection still going on. That's another bad habit. All right, but anyway, so I did two clicks. Select subject, click a mask. Two clicks to get rid of that background. There's another way. In your properties panel, which is right here, if you have a layer and it's not a smart object, because there are some rules. This button will only show up in your properties panel if it's a layer and it's not a smart object. Remove background, done. Because that does the two clicks for me in one. All that did was it did my select subject and mask in one click instead of me do it, doing it in two different spots. That's all remove background does, period. There's no magic to it, there's no Oh my God, it's amazing. That's all it does. It is amazing. But that's all it do, it's doing is it, the, the Photoshop team figure, why should we make you um, select subject and just to click mask every single time when we can make that a button? So they just made it a button. All right, so now that's, um, again, I showed you racing, the oldest way, the Photoshop 1.0 way of doing it. The second best, or probably Photoshop 2, because I don't think we had, no, Photoshop 3. We didn't have layers until Photoshop 3. So the Photoshop 3 way of doing it would be the eraser tool. Um, then I showed you masking. Then I showed you, um, I showed you um, the one-click remove button. But another way of doing this, one more time, undo. Another way of doing this is kind of like, 
It's not what I would do for this, but it's a bad habit of not using the blending options of a layer when you do need it. Like this is easier just to go ahead and click remove background, done, mask. But if I wanted to get rid of that background, I could use a blending option to do it, depending on if it's black, white, or gray, it, or depending on what colors it is, it might be easy to blend in. So if there's a distinct difference, like even though this is kind of a white lampshade, it's not the exact same color white as the background. Even though there's some reflections in here, they're not exactly the same as the background. So if you right click on a layer, at the very top of that layer, it'll say blending options. When it brings up the blending options window, you have this blend this layer, blend the underlying layer. So this layer means the layer you're on, the underlying layer obviously is the layer below it. And you have a, a slider, you have, uh, you have two, not slider, you have uh, handles on the left and right side. Well, guess what happens if you start bringing over the white handle? It just starts removing the white. Now, if you go too far, then yeah, it'll start going for the lampshade too. And maybe you want that effect, I don't know. But this way you can kind of control what's being removed on this layer. Now you can also um, split them. If you look closely, you'll notice there's a line going between them. If you just grab it, it's moving just the handle, the whole handle. But if you hold down your option or your alt key, then you can split it and get a range of blending that you're going to do. So that way you can play around with, you can play around with the range. Now again, this is not the best option for this because I can still see some white around the edge. I can still see some white over here, but not taking advantage of the blending options as a test, as a trial, as I'm trying to do something creative, maybe this will do what I wanted to do. All right. Um, <laughs> what do I do with the time I save from the one to two clicks? Uh, I make more clicks. So I get more clicks done that way. All right, so I'll cancel out of it. But again, for me, the best one for this is going to be remove background. Okay, great. Now let's talk about the, now that we got the background visibly out of the way, let, let's talk about the perspective issue with this lamp. So if I were to grab the lamp with the move tool and move it around, even if I try and set it down as much as I can, it, it's, it's really never looking like it's on that table unless I maybe bring it all the way to the edge. Right about there, it looks like it's on the table, visibly. But the reason it doesn't look like it's on the table is because you're not moving this in 3D. If this were a uh, substance um, stage stager and all that, I could do this in 3D and I could put it in perspective and move it back and so forth and so on to where it looks like it's on the table. But in Photoshop, I'm really only moving it up, down, left, and right. So I can move it to the right and down, and that maybe looks like it's more on the table, but that doesn't really look like it's on the table in any other spot because the perspective of the lamp is different. So keep in mind that you can adjust perspectives um, of objects by distorting them. So you can, you can, warp, you can first of all, free transform, command T. You can use warp. Um, in this case, warp's probably gonna be a little harder. I'm gonna give you another example of when you'd use warp. Uh, in this case, I'm just gonna right click on the selected free transform lamp and choose distort. Now, this isn't going to be perfect. I'm not trying to make this perfect. I'm just giving you an option for when something doesn't quite look right. It's because it's not the same perspective. And in this case, this lamp may never look right, but I'm just going to lean it backwards a little to where now it may look like it's more in that scene the way it's supposed to, just by leaning it. Maybe something like that. All right, now the other thing obviously that's throwing this off is because if this lamp were really there, especially on the, as light as this table is, there'd be a shadow under it. So if you were going to create a shadow, you might create an empty layer, put the layer between the lamp and the table, and then paint in a shadow underneath to kind of make that look more realistic. So you could use a paintbrush, you could duplicate the, the uh, lamp itself and, and flip it over which we're gonna do that. Make sure you're using a soft brush, black paint. We're gonna go ahead and adjust the shadow after the fact, but just kind of painting in that drop shadow. Now that shadow's way too dark, but just painting in that drop shadow underneath is gonna make that look more realistic. Then you can always lower the opacity of the shadow, 
to kind of, oh, not that much. Uh, maybe something around there. And I'd make some more adjustments to kind of maybe even warp the front of that lamp down some or to make it look like it's more on top of the table or up, depending on whatever looks better. So um, if we were to distort this one more time, distort, then I may, yeah, something like that, where I'm kind of now distorting the bottom of it to where it looks like it's really on the table now. Still a little too high. Well, you get the idea. Maybe something like that. And then I readjust my shadow. We don't want the shadow to look like it's too too much distance between the base and the, and the table because then it looks like the lamp is floating. So that's a difficult one. That's not an easy one, but it's also one of the things I want you to pay attention to. When you're putting two or more things together, are the angles right? Are the perspectives right? Does it really look like it's sitting there? Now, the average person that they walked in here now, they would see this and say, hey, there's a lamp on the table. But I'm still looking at it saying it's not quite right. It, it, like it still needs a little more work. So just keep those things in mind when you're doing this type of work. All right, next up. Um, we did not naming layers, not using new selection. Oh, not new using new selection methods. Let's go in. So, um, actually, I don't want to do it on that one. I want to do it on... Uh, 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 uh. Okay, selection methods. If I told you to select uh, one of the pieces of cantaloupe here, I guess that's cantaloupe, how would you do it? Like select that piece of can cantaloupe, duplicate it onto its own layer, move it over and make it smaller, flip it around, so forth and so on. How would you do it? How would you select that? And if you say lasso, I'll smack your hand. Because again, we would have done that with the lasso in the 90s, but we don't anymore. We definitely don't now. Um, so you might go in and you might um, you might use the magic wand. Again, I would probably smack your hand because we just don't do that anymore. You might use the, uh, what is it, the quick select tool. That, that tool is actually fairly new. If I use the quick select tool and just paint over it, boom, that's it. That got it. So a quick select tool was way better. Uh, Jamie Feldman, the pen tool. I, I still run into people that swear by the pen tool. Uh, Dr. Feldman is right. The pen tool is for, there. like there's a, there's a certain population. They're the pen tool purists. They think there is no better way of getting a selection accurately than using a pen tool. And maybe they're right. I don't know for the kind of work they're doing. Maybe the pen tool is the best. They need a mask that's perfect and spend enough time and you can get the pen tool to mask something perfectly. I just don't need mine to ever be that perfect. So the pen tool is not, not a method I would use for selections anymore. So um, quick select would have been the way I would have done this a couple years ago because it's fast, a couple clicks, done. But now there's a new object selection tool. So the object selection tool came out a couple years ago and it even got... Um, it's got two methods of working now. So when you first click the object selection tool, you'll notice this little thing spinning up here. That's because it's now detecting all the objects in your scene for auto detection. You don't have to use auto detection. You can still use it the way you used to just by dragging it around something and having it select. But object selection tries to identify the objects in the scene. So, for example, if I wanted that, it got most of it, didn't get that part. If I wanted this, it got that. If I want that, it got that. So, when I'm, when I'm hovering over it and it turns blue, all I got to do is click. And it made that selection. So, the object selection tool click, it made that selection of the, of the scarf or tablecloth or napkin or whatever that is. Uh, click, make that selection. And you can hold down your shift key and make multiple selections. So, the object selection tool in this method is by far the fastest one, but it's not necessarily the accurate, most accurate one. So let's say I wanted this bowl of um, whatever these are. It's not letting me choose that because for whatever reason, it didn't identify that as an object. This is still AI based. So while it's letting me get these other things, 
It's not letting me get the one thing I may need. So this is fast, quick when it identifies the objects correctly, but when it doesn't, you still can use it. So instead of me, since I can't click on that, I'm still gonna hold down my shift key. Oh wait, oh, I'll get the outside. I hold down my shift key and I can just drag around it because it's a lasso and a rectangle. And when I drag around it, it, there it goes. It makes the selection perfectly. So even though I did that stupid, weird outside lasso, it said, oh, he's trying to get this. Boom, done. So this is by far the one of the quickest ways. Uh, it's, it's still using the pen tool a bad habit? No, it, again, because I clarified it. There are some people that think the pen tool is best for them. So it's not a bad habit if, if your workflow demands that type of selection. And the pen tool also creates a vector mask, a vector um, path, I should say. So there are reasons to use the pen tool. I am I just don't have any, like it's, the pen tool is not for me. So if you got a reason to use pen tool, go for it, use pen tool. All right, um, select the table if it would select wood. If it would select wood. Oh, select the table if it would select wood. Uh, yeah, this I don't know what this is going to do if I click. Let's see. Yeah, it selected all. It selected all. Of, it tried to select everything around it. So that's not right. Okay. Anyway, so if I uh, just drag around it, even though I'm not doing this very accurately at all, it's very good at figuring out what you're trying to do. Now I still missed the inside of that, but that would be a quick, easy fix uh, by holding down the Option key or Alt key to say, no, I don't want this, so take that away. So that allowed me to quickly and easily select those things without me having to even think twice about it. So this is when, when would I use this tool? When the subject is not easy to identify. Because when I, if I were to ask you, what's the subject of this photo? Well, you'd probably say all the food. Well, select subject wouldn't necessarily guess that right. So this is when select subject doesn't work <laughs> like because the subject's not clear. Like it wouldn't know what the subject is in this. So select subject would be my first choice. When select subject doesn't work, then I go to the selection tools. Object selection tool for this kind of selection work is great. Uh, what about focus selection tools? Again, we're now we're just arguing methods. They're all good. It depends on what you're trying to do. This image is not, there's no depth of field here. So the focus selection tool in this case would not be good. But if you've got a clear, shallow depth of field example, the focus selection tools would be great. So again, any, any way that works best for the job, for the photo, but not using old lasso, you know, magic wand, that stuff, unless you got a really good reason to use it. So I'm not saying don't ever, I'm saying try better. Try other newer, not even better, try newer selection methods. If you figure, nope, magic wand is still the best one for this type of selection, go for it. Use your magic wand. All right. Um, next up, we did using old selections. Um, let's go into this one. Remember I told you I'd give you an a, a example. When people try and um, <clears throat> make reflections and they don't necessarily <clears throat> excuse me they try and make a reflection and they don't necessarily um end up with a good result because the the thing they're trying to reflect is not lining up properly properly let's let's call it that so let's say i want to make it look like she's standing on glass and therefore her her feet and part of her legs would be reflected down. So the way we would always do this, we'd select the subject, duplicate the layer, uh, free transform, flip it upside down directly, drag it down. That all still works, but watch what happens with her feet when I do this because of the angle she was photographed at. So if I go to select subject, great, figures out the subject. And even if it doesn't get the hair right, I don't care. You're not gonna see the hair anyway. Uh, Command J or PC Control J, fastest way to duplicate your selection onto its own layer. So there she is on her own layer. And again, I don't care that it didn't do the hair right because you're not going to see the hair anyway. 
Um, so now that I've got that on its own on its own layer, Command T, free transform, PC Control T, and then right click on the selection and choose Flip Vertical. That will make a mirror image upside down. So Flip Vertical, great. Now, when I pull and I hold down your shift key, when you start pulling this, it'll pull it straight down. But here, oh, not that far. Here's what happens. When, when you pull this straight down and you try and line it up, that's what you end up with. You end up with the feet not looking right. And what people will do is they'll just leave it at that and go ahead and lower the opacity and maybe use a mask and whatever. You got to make the feet touch. You got to make the feet line up. So in order to do that, that's when we use warp. That's when we use something that will bend the shadow or the reflection onto the, um, onto the original. So for example, we might go in and while it's still selected in free transform, we click the warp button and the warp button. Now you can add more points. You can do, you can split, you can do all kinds of cool things than just using the grid, but the grid is okay for what we're going to do here. So I'm just going to pull this up and bend it down and pull it up and get it just right. And again, it doesn't have to be perfect because we're going to blend it out anyway, but just allowing that to touch will make this look more realistic. Okay. So now I've got that as its own on its own layer. Don't worry about it the way it looks now because we're going to lower the opacity of it. Great. And now it looks like, see how that looks like it's under her pants leg now, the way it's supposed to. And then if, if it were, this is the other thing, if it were a reflection, unless the glass was all the way out, you like normally the reflection would fade out. So to make, to make that reflection look like it's fading out, we're going to add a layer mask. So we're going to add a layer mask to this just like that. And then we're going to go in and we're going to uh, grab our gradient tool, hit the letter G, that'll take you to the gradient. We're going to do a black to white gradient. Since black is the color that's going to hide, white's going to be the color that's going to leave it or reveal it. We're going to go from the bottom up. We're going to paint black up or gradient black up to white. So to do that, we'll just grab our, um, or just start from the bottom and just drag up a little bit. That's too much because it fades out too harshly. So let me give myself a little bit more room, undo, and make it more gradual. Yeah, something like that. Get a little closer, more gradual, too much, almost, something like, eh, I kind of like the one before that, hold on. Yeah, something like that, and then again, I can still lower the opacity to my heart's content. To kind of get that reflection looking more realistic. But without the warp, it wouldn't have looked right. Um, and plus the floor has its own perspective. Exactly. So the agony of the feats, <laughs> you gotta also remember it's got its own shadow too. So you gotta, you know, keep that in mind. All right. But that's kind of just not using, not again, thinking of how this would look in real life and not using the right tool, not warping when you should, if you're trying to create a reflection, bad habit, not taking advantage of warp. That's what I had. All right, next up, uh, let's go in and I got a picture of Krista here, one I took recently. Now, typically I would do a lot of what I'm about to show you right in Lightroom. That's, that's where the photo is, but not taking advantage of camera raw inside of Photoshop is a bad habit. Not creating a smart object is another bad habit. So first bad habit, I want to run a filter on this. If I mess up and I didn't duplicate the layer, then I'd be messed up. So either A, first thing we learn, duplicate the layer, or B, better yet, instead of creating two layers when I don't really need two layers, go into your filter menu and say convert for smart filters. Because if I say convert for smart filters, that will convert this into a layer, so it's no longer the background, and it makes it a smart object. So I still get to work with one layer. It's gonna be non-destructive. If I mess up in the filter, no problem, because it's a smart object, I can always turn it off, come back and, or redo it. So that saves me space because I'm not having to do, make it just a copy of the background just to do this. All right, so that was another bad habit, not using um, smart objects. N next bad habit, not using the camera raw filter. 
So let me show you the camera raw filter under filter, camera raw filter. Now, why is this a bad habit not using it? What I really should be saying is using older methods. And again, this is going to cause a, a debate and a battle and a fight. I'm not trying to fight with you. Do what you want. It's your, I'm not standing over your shoulder telling you, you can't do this. But in my opinion, <laughs> the opinion of Terry White, in my opinion, using um, levels and curves is outdated. There, I said it. I'm not taking it back. Levels and curves still is great. Still works. People love it. Blah, 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 blah. In my opinion, <laughs> levels and curves is outdated. Meaning that, um, yes, they still work. Yes, they're still powerful. Yes, they still do all the things you want to do. Oh, my God, I'm not trying to take them away from you. Keep using them all you want. I don't use them anymore. Rarely will I ever use levels and curves. Rarely. Now, that's me. You do whatever you want to do. The reason I don't need to use them as much or at all is because everything I would need to do with levels and curves, I can do in camera raw. That may not be your case, but it is for me. All right, so did I tell you to stop using them? No, I did not. Did I tell you I don't use them anymore? Yes, I did. So there we are. Okay, so here we are. So I'm going to go in and first of all, uh, make sure the white balance is okay. So there is no better way in Photoshop to get correct white balance than Camera Raw Filter because you don't have a real good white balance tool in, in Photoshop proper. So with this, I can just go click on something that should be um, neutral gray, black, or white, click, and it was okay to begin with, so I didn't need, really need to fix anything. But my favorite thing here is going ahead and hitting auto. Because what the auto will do is a lot of that work I would have had to do in levels and curves is being done automatically. And even if it didn't get it right, I still have easy sliders to adjust. Levels and curves takes work. It takes knowledge of how they work. And to me, it's just extra work. It's like, Getting the levels and curves right is a science. I'm not prepared to deal with the time it takes to get that right when I can just do it here with sliders. So if I felt that the image should be more exposed, um, I can drag the exposure slider. If I felt it should be less exposed, if I felt the shadow should be brought up. Again, I'm thinking of when I'm when I'm saying all of this, I'm thinking of, of, of curves. I just have a slider called shadows. I have a slider called blacks and whites. I have a shadow called whatever I want. I mean, I have a, uh, I'm sorry, a slider called whatever I need as opposed to having to do it in levels and curves. Again, one last time. If you love levels and curves, keep using levels and curves. This is me. All right, so what adjustment do you use for masking a local area? That's coming up right now. Let's say I wanted to make her a little more uh, exposure up a little bit, a little bit brighter, but I don't want it to also adjust the background. So if I keep adjusting her exposure up, then everything gets brighter and that's not what I want. So over here, there's a masking icon, which is amazing. So if I click the masking icon, I can hit select subject. She gets selected. Then I come to here and I click invert. Now the background selected. So I can bring the exposure of the background back down. So now it just looks like she's just lit more as opposed to having to do this with um, the other things I mentioned that I don't use anymore, that you still use, which is fine. Great, keep using them. All right, um, okay. So let's go back to the adjustments. Uh, so if I need to make her warmer, if I need to make her cooler, if I need, oh, that's actually a cool effect. If I wanted to do that just on the background, I could. So if I go back to that mask, and I go to, since that mask is there, if I want to make the background cooler, am I on that mask? There we go. Select that mask. Make the background cooler. The background turns blue. The background gets warmer. None of that is affecting her. So I can actually create a cool effect just doing that here in Camera Raw Filter. Okay. So now, yep, happy accident. That's exactly what that was. Good call. So, and I could go in and do some local adjustments too and all that, but that stuff is better in Photoshop. So that I would keep doing in Photoshop. But all of this levels and curves stuff that I would normally have had to do in levels and curves, I can I find it easier and more intuitive to do it here. You do what you want. 
Click OK. Done. And best of all, because I use the smart object, I can always turn that off. I can always turn it on. Best part, not just turning it off and turning it on or throwing it away. If I messed up, I can double click on the camera raw filter here, go right back into the exact same adjustments and continue to tweak them. So if I thought the um, overall image should still be brighter, I can make the overall image still brighter and not affect um, anything else permanently. So camera raw filter, my go-to for all the old stuff I would have normally had to do. And the other thing I love about camera raw filter is it's per layer. So every layer can have a different camera raw filter applied to it. So very powerful tool that a lot of people ignore because they're stuck on the way they like doing it the, the other way. Okay, we'll leave it there. All right, um, <laughs> give, me, give me a sec. I'm fixing my old stuff with new stuff. Great. Uh, Camera Raw and Lightroom Classic, same thing for the most part. 99.9% .9 of it is the same. Uh, there are a couple things that you would still be, you still have access to in Lightroom because you're working with the raw file. But Camera Raw, remember, there's two Camera Raws. This Camera Raw, which if I open up a raw file, that is exactly like Lightroom Classic. Camera Raw Filter is a subset of all the Camera Raw adjustments in a filter. So that's why I said 99% of it. But Camera Raw is the exact same thing as your develop module. Okay, uh, I'm sure I've hit 10, but let's keep going. Let's go here and let's go to, we did that. Oh, here's another one. So I talked about selection methods already. I wanna select his shirt. So I'm gonna to go to my object selection tool. I'm not even gonna wait for it to try and select it as an object. I'm just gonna drag a lasso around the shirt like that and boom, selects the shirt. Great, now I wanna change the color of a shirt. If you try changing the color of something that's white or something that's black, you've known how hard it can be trying to use other methods of changing colors. There's a color uh, replacement tool. There's uh, all kinds of, you know, blending modes and all that. But one of the fastest, easiest ways of changing the color of something is using an adjustment layer. So there's adjustment layers and things you can apply on top of something to change the color of it. So for example, I want to change the color of a shirt. Down here, I've got the uh, mask, but to the right of it, I'm going to click and apply a solid color. So when I apply a solid color, the default color came up was black. Great, made a black t-shirt. But I'm going to go ahead and choose maybe a blue. And keep in mind, it does say solid color for a reason. So what I lost when I did that, what's covering it up is all the detail in the shirt, like the collar, the lines in it. It's just a solid blue pattern over the whole thing. There's no uh, mid-tones. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and click OK on that. That's OK, because now the next thing we're going to do is use a blend mode to fix it. The blend mode when you're trying to fix something that's white and make it a color would be multiply. The blend mode that you're going to use when you're trying to um, take something that's black and make it a color is going to be, I think it's overlay. I have it in my note over here. I think it's overlay. Uh, 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 uh. Screen mode. Screen mode. So screen mode when it's black, multiply when it's white. So I'm going to choose multiply. And now look, all the wrinkles came back in the shirt. Let me get out of that tool. All the wrinkles came back in the shirt. The collar came back. Basically, the shirt looks like the shirt now. And because I've set that blend mode to the color overlay, I can now always go back to the color overlay and pick a different color. So if I wanted to be a, um, if I wanted to match the color I'm wearing right now, a little darker, maybe something like, something like that. There we go. Quickly and easily changing the color, and you can go um, back. Okay, I'm not even sure what that said or what that's referring to. Referring to, thanks, Terry. Great stream. Okay, great. All right. Um, so, bad habit: not using your um, all of your adjustment layer capabilities. So, for example, another adjustment layer that I love to use. And let's just duplicate this layer so I can show it to you on top. 
let's move that back up. So now we're back to a white shirt. Uh, another adjustment layer I love using is black and white, if I'm not using Camera Raw Filter, because Camera Raw Filter has profiles and all kinds of cool things. But another adjustment layer that I've used quite a bit, black and white adjustment layer, because the color is still there. So you've got this targeted adjustment tool that if you were to come over and click and you start dragging on the image, will adjust your black and white and get the tone of your black and white just right. That to me is even a little easier here than it is in Camera Raw Filter or Lightroom. You can still do it in, in, in all three places, but I like doing it here. The black and white adjustment layer is awesome for this kind of stuff. Okay, I'm out of time. I hope you have uh, benefited from seeing some bad habits and seeing some better ways or maybe different ways of approaching your projects from now on. And I want to uh, thank everyone for joining me for these live streams up until Max. we got some cool stuff to show you uh, once Max hits. I'll have some videos posted on my YouTube channel. Cheers, everyone. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you on the next one.